great to be here. We're getting into the middle of the afternoon segment, and we're going to start off by talking about what's more Bitcoin than Bitcoin. All right, so controversy right off the bat, right? Yeah. So I think it's an interesting uh, concept. What is more Bitcoin than Bitcoin? And I think that largely comes into play with a lot of the projects in this space that uh, try to sell themselves as the next Bitcoin. But ultimately, Bitcoin is the alpha and the omega. There is no, nothing more Bitcoin than Bitcoin. And there will never be like a Bitcoin 2.0 or 3.0 because Bitcoin is really money. And that's kind of the topic of our discussion today, right? Bitcoin is money. You don't have uh, money 2.0. You have fiat currencies that maybe fail over time. And then you have a new fiat, like, you know, this fiat currency went uh, hyperinflation and now we have a new one to replace it, right? But Bitcoin is sound money. There's just Bitcoin. I'll tell you, we could get really meta here today in the afternoon, but let's take a step back. I'm really excited because, Samson, you are, you've been in this space for a long time. Blockstream is obviously a, a big player. So for those who don't know, can you tell us a little bit more about who you are, how you got into blockchain, and about Blockstream? Sure. So uh, my name is Samson. I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer at Blockstream. Uh, I oversee product development, biz dev, marketing. I also have a game company called Pixelmatic. But how I got into the space was uh, running an exchange. So I used to run BTCC or BTC China, which was one of the largest exchanges in the world. I think Mt. Gox imploded, and then all the traffic just went over to BTC China, and it became number one for a pretty good chunk of time. Uh, I'm also involved in mining. Uh, BTC China ran a mining pool. It's also one of the largest mining pools, and you know, I've taken some of that experience over to Blockstream, where you know, Blockstream, if you don't know, is a Bitcoin infrastructure company. We're building out a lot of the underlying tech, uh, working on the Bitcoin protocol, working on systems to augment Bitcoin and make it more powerful. And we have a really cool thing called Blockstream Satellite, which is a satellite service that's actually broadcasting the Bitcoin blockchain from geosynchronous satellites in orbit around the Earth. So if you had a dish right now and you aligned it to one of our satellites, you'd actually download the Bitcoin blockchain for free. And you know, that helps you save on your bandwidth. It helps you with your privacy, because now your ISP can't monitor your internet traffic and know you're running a Bitcoin node. But yeah, we do a lot of interesting, interesting stuff. We have uh, our mining operation at Blockstream now. So I think we announced it a few months ago. Uh, we have a mining facility in Quebec and one in Georgia in the US with, for a total of 300 megawatts. So we're an up and coming player in the Bitcoin mining space too. Cool, very cool. Can you uh, tell us a little bit more about Liquid and about off-chain protocols? Sure. So uh, Blockstream was largely founded to build out this sidechain technology. So Liquid is a Bitcoin sidechain. And what that is, a sidechain is a blockchain that has no native currency. So Liquid is a blockchain secured, secured by a network of functionaries, which are generating blocks. So unlike Bitcoin, it's not mined. It is actually block signing. So this function, functionary network it's mostly crypto exchanges. We have some of the largest crypto exchanges in the world as part of the network. We have Bitfinex, BitMEX, OKCoin, OKX, Huobi, uh, BTSE, and a whole bunch of others. But you know, they're generating the blocks of the network. And the primary use right now is inter-exchange settlement. So you peg in Bitcoin into the side chain and you get new properties. So for Liquid, you have one minute block times and final settlement in two minutes. So what that allows you to do is to move funds quickly from exchange A to exchange B. And because you're moving from a centralized, exchanges, a centralized exchange to another centralized exchange, you don't really need to go back down to the main Bitcoin layer. You can go to this intermediary layer, which we call a layer 1.5, to kind of move funds quickly uh, from exchange to exchange. Cool. And how does that relate to institutions and some of the, the new flow of money coming into exchanges or you know, transactions, OTC? Right, so Liquid has a lot of cool stuff in it. So in addition to faster block times, we also have confidential transactions. So these are essentially Bitcoin transactions that you can't see the amount or the asset type that is being sent. And what that allows you to do is uh, move funds, large amounts of Bitcoin from exchange to exchange without anyone monitoring. Because right now, because the blockchain is so open, the Bitcoin blockchain is so open, you can monitor the chain and you can see like, uh, Andrew, you just deposited 100,000 Bitcoins to BitMEX. You know, I'm going to trade against you, right? Or to Bitfinex, I'm going to trade against you. Mm. But if you're moving Bitcoins in liquid, it's actually all hidden. 
So no one can actually front run you. Uh, the other cool stuff that relates, I guess, to OTC desks is you can now trade trustlessly in liquid because you can do what is called a single chain atomic swap or what we're calling a liquid swap now, which is a transaction that only executes when both sides sign off on it and it just happens in the, when we generate a block. So there's no need for trust. Uh, you eliminate counterparty risk and it allows, it opens up the playing field for smaller OTC players. Because right now for the large OTC desks, what they're doing is they're offloading counterparty risk to you. So if you go to a large OTC, they'll say, send me your dollars first or send me your uh, Bitcoin first. And then when we finish on our side, we'll send it back to you what you want. But now I can trade with anybody in the world because of this single chain atomic swap. So I can tra trade liquid Bitcoin for liquid Tether. So um, I think a few months ago, Tether started issuing liquid Tether, uh, basically Tether, USDT, in the liquid network. Very cool. You know, as, as a writer and also as an entrepreneur, I've uh, sort of see the chasm between us creators in a room like this in an echo chamber, and I see the greater world around us, consumers, everyday people, people who represent mass adoption. And sort of, we have them over here, and over here, we, we in the industry are creating the technologies, and there's a current distance. And I think a lot of the people who are right here who know about Bitcoin and even about Ethereum or other platforms, they assume that tokenization of assets is based on smart contracts, right? Ethereum, EOS. Mm -hmm. We don't hear a lot about Bitcoin being a, a, a method for tokenizing. We think about it as a method of exchange, right? Or an exchange of, of value, a store of value. So tell us about that dynamic. Like, we hear a lot about Bitcoin as one thing. We hear about these protocols as something else. What does Liquid do, and why is Bitcoin, in your opinion, important? Or what does it do that those other ones can't, that you advocate so hard for? All right. Bitcoin. So a lot of people are interested in tokenization. And Previously, there have been some efforts to tokenize on Bitcoin, so you've had things like RGB and colored coins come out. But they're not that reliable, I think. The interesting thing about how we're handling tokenized assets with Liquid uh, as a Bitcoin sidechain is those tokens in, in Liquid are native to the chain. So they're at the same level as, say, Bitcoin in the main chain, in the Liquid chain. So what you can do is have enhanced security. Uh, you can have multi-sig, just like a Bitcoin multi-sig transaction. You can do a multi-sig liquid tether transaction or a tokenized security. You can have multi-sig issuance and transacting of it. So one thing we actually built for tether in liquid was uh, multi-sig issuance. That was something they were very interested in for their security because they want to have multiple parties sign off on new issuance of liquid tether. Um, but the other benefits are basically tying into a lot of that security security that's been built in the Bitcoin ecosystem with things like hardware wallets. So, you know, most people are using a, a ledger or Trezor to secure their Bitcoin. Well, they're rolling out support for liquid assets. So if you're issuing, you know, Andrew token in liquid, you can store that on a hardware wallet for security. But you can of derive those ecosystem benefits by issuing a token in liquid. Uh, but you also have that battle testedness of Bitcoin. Your Bitcoin's been out for 10 years now. It's uh, the most stable protocol out there, and Liquid is built on a fork of Bitcoin. So you have that same reliability and also that same scalability. Um, but for general tokenization, I think what we need to do is look at what's going to happen down the road, like 10, 20 years later. Uh, blockchains don't scale inherently. Blockchains do not scale. So what you need is something like Lightning. So for us at Blockstream, we've been investing in Lightning R&D since 2015. Um, we have C Lightning, which is one of the main Lightning implementations, but we just released a version of Lightning today that supports uh, liquid Bitcoins. So Bitcoins in liquid can now run a Lightning network. But where I'm going with that is you can actually run a Lightning network on top of any liquid asset. So if you issue your token in liquid, like say liquid Tether, uh, we also have a, a JPY stablecoin coming from Japan that's regulated. And I think there's an Australian dollar stablecoin. Uh, Bull Bitcoin is working on a Canadian dollar stablecoin as well, uh, along with a few others. But all of these stablecoins or tokens can actually have a lightning network because it is a native asset to the liquid blockchain. So that is really building for the future 10, 20 years out, where you could still have a stablecoin and spend that stablecoin in a retail setting, paying for coffee or 
using it for a machine-to-machine -machine payment denominated in you know, dollars or, or Japanese yen. Uh, but we've also been working on another angle for liquid, which is liquid securities. We announced this platform at Consensus earlier this year, but it's a, it's a layer on top of liquid that manages tokens to handle requirements from companies issuing securities or STOs on a blockchain like Liquid. So what we can do with Liquid Securities is handle things like uh, whitelist, blacklist, uh, trading velocity limits, and everything else. And we've actually finalized our partnership with Tokensoft, which is a company that does a lot of tokenization for uh, players in this space that want to issue, issue a tokenized security. So they're integrating Liquid into their platform. But we have an API as well as a front end. And we have a lot of interesting partners that we're working with to do tokenize assets and securities on Liquid. Cool, cool. So in terms of people, real life people, um, something that I'm always thinking about with technologies, again, we have a disconnect or distance between the innovators and mass adoption. And when we were creating the smart home industry, um, you know, smart doorbells, smart locks, smart lights, a lot of people didn't understand why these technologies mattered to them. And over six or seven years, we had to tell stories uh, to customers so that they would you know, embrace the technology. And I see the same thing happening in blockchain where people are just talking about the attributes of the technologies or what's possible and, and creating developer communities. I don't really hear a whole lot of people answering the question, how do we get to a level of adoption that matters? Right. right. All of this doesn't, isn't you know, worth it if we don't have adoption. So what does all of this mean to everyday consumers? <sighs> Let's see. So I think for everyday consumers, they may not necessarily use Bitcoin because Bitcoin as its primary function is uncensorable money. Uh, it's a store of value and it's an asset that you can invest in. So it, it's kind of like the question of, is everyone going to adopt gold, right? People don't readily put their money into gold. I think uh, in America, at least, even saving money is a challenge for people, right? Like yeah. there is a, a trend towards spending more than you earn, uh, getting into debt, relying heavily on credit. So given that kind of situation, like why would people put their money into Bitcoin? And they also need to learn about Bitcoin. And that's why I think there's a lot of education needed in this space to teach people about Bitcoin. But it's not about what Bitcoin is, how it works, but rather like why Bitcoin? And I think the adoption, mass adoption, will just come naturally. So if you think about it, the internet gave birth to Bitcoin, right? We can have Bitcoin today because we have the internet. Uh, Bitcoin is a protocol that lives on top of another protocol. It's kind of like another layer of the internet, but transacting money and value. But the internet is also what I think is going to kill fiat currency, because you have a way for people now to be fully aware of what's happening around them. Whereas in the past, like say you had uh, gold certificates issued on top of gold, and you don't have things like telecommunications, much less the internet. It's hard to understand like, what the banks or custodians have in their vaults versus the gold certificates in circulation, right? There's a information asymmetry over the end user of that money and what's actually going on behind the scenes. But even the current financial system, you know, it, it is relatively transparent because of the internet. People can see, they can hear, there are reporters telling them what's going on. You know, the central banks are now saying it's not quantitative easing, but people can talk on social media and say, yes, it is quantitative easing, mm -hmm. like, yeah. oh, screw you. So it, it's really about awareness and it will take time. Bitcoin, the white paper, I think, is celebrating its 11th birthday now but Bitcoin itself like, is 10. And for a new money to evolve and come into public awareness, everyday use, it's, taking, it's gonna take more than 10 years. This is like uh, hundreds of years before it's ubiquitous. And I think for a lot of Bitcoiners, that is something they're okay with. Uh, Bitcoiners are okay to sacrifice you know, short-term adoption for long-term prosperity, basically thinking on a longer time horizon. Whereas uh, I guess the area for, that is dangerous for a lot of you know, retail people or everyday people is being sucked into the blockchain snake oil sales because other projects are working on shorter time horizons. They need to sell themselves as better than Bitcoin. So they need to differentiate on certain points. So you have a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, misleading arguments. So 
projects like to pick on Bitcoin and use what they perceive as Bitcoin deficiencies to sell their own projects. So a common one is transactions per second, right? Bitcoin only has seven transactions a second. Therefore, our blockchain has a 30 or a thousand, and I've seen people advertise 400,000 transactions yeah. a second. <laughs> but the thing is, Bitcoin is not a payments rail. It's a settlement layer. That's why blocks, there is a blockchain, which is really a chain of blocks, and it takes 10 minutes to release a block. And that is to keep the network in sync, because it's not a payments thing. You don't walk into a store and pay and wait 10 minutes with a merchant for a, settle, a confirmation, right? And that's only one confirmation. You technically should get a few more, depending on the size of the transaction, right? But everyone's like trying to pick these metrics to beat Bitcoin on. And I think that is what people should be aware of in general. Bitcoin is a settlement layer. Where Bitcoin is powerful is the ability to move massive amounts of capital in a censorship-resistant way and in, in a permissionless way to anywhere around the world. Like, I think someone did a calculation. From uh, birth till now, Bitcoin has transacted seven, $11 trillion. That's a lot of money. That's significant. Right? But it's not a payment system, right? Payment system, you would look at how many transactions I'm doing. Like Visa cares about that. But for Bitcoin, no. It's about how much money you're moving because it is money. But to counter that point, this is why we have Lightning. Because Lightning is what makes Bitcoin cash. It is actually the ability to transact Bitcoin instantaneously and almost for free. And that is what's going to let people take Bitcoin from a store of value to a medium of exchange. But without being a store of value first, it's impossible to become a medium of exchange, right? Like, I can make Samson coin and say it's a medium of exchange. We're just going to use this to pay for stuff. But does it have value? That's the question, right? I think that is the big, the big question. That's what I have. The same question for a lot of the you know startups and a lot of the different projects you know at these conferences is what is the value? And a lot of times I hear oh, you know borderless payments, and I'm just hearing the attributes of the blockchain. Mm -hmm. I'm not hearing a core differentiation. I'm not hearing why I as a consumer should leave Venmo to start using you know crypto. Yeah. So I think that's what I'm most excited about is which projects, which technologies are going to start telling better stories to cross the chasm of adoption. And so I, I like that we're on the future now because my next question and what I'm always curious about is what you kind of gave us a long-term horizon. What do you see technology-wise or industry trend-wise in the next, let's say, one to two years? Well, I think one to two years, uh, I, we're probably going to see a lot more projects saturate this space because there's a big incentive to launch your own blockchain, right? And until people really understand, like, a blockchain is really a database. You can't sell someone a database and say, this is secure. Like, as a company, I can't sell you some, you know, Samson SQL database and say, this will take care of everything for you, right? Because how do you secure the database? You need some protocols in place. You need firewalls. You need checks and balances internally to monitor if anyone's tampering with your database. But that is just not considered. Everyone's just focusing on blockchain, the word. And they, con they conflate the word blockchain with security. Because Bitcoin's blockchain has a massive amount of security, right? We're consuming the power needed to power a small country to secure the Bitcoin blockchain every single day. That's a massive amount of security. So when people talk about blockchain, that is what they're thinking of. They're thinking security because Bitcoin has that. But not every guy's blockchain has that level of security. They can be attacked. There's a site out there called, uh, uh, I forgot what it's called, I think 51 something, 51crypto.app or something. But if you Google nice hashable, they have this metric there, like other blockchains out there, how prone, are, how prone are they to attacks? And most things you can pay, most blockchains you can pay this site, uh, pay nice hash a few thousand dollars and you can 51% attack them. So that's not very safe, right? So near term, I think there's still going to be a proliferation of these projects, but longer term, people will come back to Bitcoin. Everyone comes back to Bitcoin in the end. And the thing that I think most people need to be aware of is a lot of projects out there are IEOing, ICOing, or whatever to get more Bitcoin. Mm. So short term, in the past 6, 12 months, we've seen market dominance of Bitcoin go up. Um, do you think that trend is going to continue? Do you think people are starting to come back to Bitcoin? It, so market dominance has been coming back. Like We've seen it on the increase. But I really hate that metric. Mm. Because that's based off of market cap of a coin. So I can mint a trillion Samson coin 
and get it listed on one of these websites. And if I can sell you one for a dollar, I have a trillion dollar market cap. Bitcoin dominance goes down. Those sites aren't accounting for liquidity. For people that have run an exchange, you know, it's all about liquidity. It's about market depth, not about volume. Volume can be spoofed, right? And volume is really meaningless. It's really about how much demand there is for this asset out there. And Bitcoin is a massive liquidity pool. Like I tweeted the other day, you know, liquidity is king. That's really true. Like, if you don't have that liquidity, you can't really do anything with it. Right. Unless your blockchain or your protocol exists to be a transfer layer or a payments layer, right? Then it doesn't matter because you're just moving things fluidly. And Bitcoin itself is just valuable. You can transact billions of dollars for, you, know, you could pay a few cents if you wanted to, but most people pay a few dollars to move a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. But it's still about market depth and liquidity. Right, so if you look at that long tail then and you shorten it up of the coins that are actually transacting, have liquidity, have some sense of relevance, do you have an idea or a guesstimate of Bitcoin's dominance within that category? Like if you were to take out and omit all of those smaller projects that aren't, that are, they're skewing the ratio but aren't actually real or impacting mm -hmm. everyday life, what would that, that percentage now look like? I think it's probably like 90%. Yeah. The real Bitcoin dominance is probably 90%. And that will just keep on increasing over time. Interesting. All right, so we've got two more minutes left. One of my favorite questions for people is, what do you wish more people knew? Just, oh, it's open-ended. At night, when you're driving, when you're flying, you're just like, man, I wish people understood this about blockchain or crypto. What would it be? So I think my perspective is really Bitcoin is sound money. And what I wish people knew is what money is. And I think we're getting there. Like, the discussion, the frame of discussion these days has changed a lot. Like, 10 years ago, no one talks about fiat. People talk about money. But today, people are talking about fiat and Bitcoin. So there is becoming, we're getting this distinction between fiat, which is money printed out of thin air, and Bitcoin, which is sound money. And we're seeing, like, in, with our own eyes, you know, hyperinflation, uh, currencies disappearing before our very eyes, right? We're seeing money being a tool for surveillance. We're seeing governments take money out of circulation and causing havoc, like in India. So what I wish people know more about is really what is money? Because thinking about that, Bitcoin makes a lot of sense. You have an apolitical asset that is global. It's the first truly global money that we've ever had. I think gold served that role for a time, but it's not able to do that because it's hard to move and store gold. Right. But as people understand, then Bitcoin just slots into that, that piece of the puzzle and they understand, okay, that's why we have Bitcoin. Because now I can transact with anybody. Because I think money is a, the freedom to transact should be a, a fundamental human right. We have a lot of other human rights out there, right? Like the right to free speech, you know, Americans have the right to bear arms, but if you don't have the right to transact or you don't have privacy, mm. you can't do any of that. If you want, you have the right to assemble and to protest, but you can't pay the subway because you know, they blocked your credit card. Right. You can't go there. You have the right to bear arms, but if the guy selling the guns says, you know, your money's no good here because you know, you're a bad person, or your money is just no good, you can't buy the arms. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thanks for uh, being here, sharing your wisdom, and we're out of time. So thank you, everybody. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew.